everyone, and welcome to Mercer Investments on LinkedIn Live. I'm Zenith Patel, an Alternatives Investment Director based in London. Before we get started, I want to welcome those joining in the audience. Please share a comment and let us know where you're joining from. So today's focus is on the next private debt frontier, private debt secondaries. Now we know private debt as an asset class has grown significantly over the last decade to become a 1.5 trillion US dollar industry today. To share insights on the potential opportunities in the private debt space, I'm joined by David Scopoletti, Mercer's Global Head of Private Debt, and Benny Bauman, Mercer's Head of Secondary Investments. If you're not already following David and Benny, I encourage you to do so and reach out to them after the conversation today to ask them more questions and get the debate going. We also encourage you to follow Mercer Investments and subscribe to our monthly newsletter, Navigating Investments. So let's kick off with the subject at hand and ask some questions. David, maybe I'll put you in the hot seat first. Sure. So <laughs> a decade is a long time. And over that time, we've seen the private debt asset class evolve to offer various strategies and access points. Now, for many of our listeners joining today, I'm sure that they are familiar with what private debt as an asset class offers. But can you share what has been some of the key developments that makes private debt even more compelling to invest in today? Thanks, Zena, and thank you for everyone who's joining uh, this uh, the session on LinkedIn. Now, the case for private debt in both absolute and relevant, relative terms has never been stronger. Uh, I'm a big fan of the concept of, of known unknowns and the market shocks that we have seen in the credit markets over the past few years has really demonstrated that the private debt market um, has been a place where borrowers uh, can go access capital. With the broadly syndicated loan and high yield markets, uh, they've effectively been shut, uh, as many of you know, for the past uh, past year. Private debt has really filled that void, and it's continuing to grow as an asset class because the markets have shifted. Uh, there is and, and will continue to be a credit contraction globally. We're seeing that as banks struggle with their deposit bases or, you know, at the end of the day, regulators are putting pressure on banks to shore up their balance sheets. Uh, for a number of reasons. One of them actually is if you think about lending, lending can create inflation as a force multiplier effect. So there is, you know, that that credit contraction in, in the market globally, private debt is coming in to, to fill that uh, to fill that void. For investors, I actually think private debt is a Swiss army knife. Uh, on the one hand, uh, when rates are low, uh, investors use private debt to generate higher uh, returns for their portfolios. And when rates start to rise, they use it as a, as a tool to combat inflation. Um, so it really has a lot of different um, uh, play uh, places in a, in, a, in a portfolio. And if you think about where we are today, on a relative basis, uh, the market data shows that you know senior secured loans are generating about a 10% return on an unlevered basis. And what's happening is base rates have increased, you know, four to four and a half percent globally over the past year. Credit spreads have also widened, widened somewhere between 50 and 150 basis points. And obviously, we have better credit protections in the market um, as lenders um, are, are in the driver's seat, if you will. And I think the one other thing that's that's really exciting and where we are today is the private debt asset class is continuing to grow, but it's also continuing to specialize. And in fact, the specialization we're seeing is with NAV financing, portfolio financing, GP solutions. And within all of that, one of the most interesting areas, and it's very nascent, but it is starting to grow, and we're seeing managers raise capital, is private debt secondaries. It's a new solution that both private debt investors, uh, private uh, debt asset managers, even private equity uh, managers can use in their portfolios. So I'm surprised you use the analogy of a Swiss army knife because I expected that to come from Benny, given that he's based in Switzerland out of Zurich. Uh, but nonetheless, um, I'm glad you touched on secondaries because that's Benny's area of expertise. And Benny, if I can move to you and bring the conversation first to secondaries more generally. Um, now, in some markets and across some investment investor segments, we are seeing demand or fundraising reduce. 
this may be true for primary fund allocations, but it's not necessarily the case for the secondary market, in particular private debt secondaries, as David mentioned earlier. Why is this, Benny? What's making secondary allocations in particular look so attractive for investors? Yeah, thank you, Sinat, and uh, thank you for inviting me to join uh, you and David to this LinkedIn Live event, which, uh, by the way, is a novelty for me, so uh, I hope I don't botch this up. <laughs> uh, but no, uh, to your question, so um, let's maybe just take a step back and, and quickly outline the, the sources of secondary transactions and uh, what they can actually do in private market portfolio context. Because I think the, that perspective will lead us directly into why we see such tremendous growth uh, in this segment. So if we talk about secondaries, uh, we generally refer to either limited partnership interest of primary funds being offered for sale by investors in those funds, or uh, as the audience will know, assets uh, held within limited partnerships being offered for sale and continued management actually in most instances of the same general partners of those funds. Therefore, it is easy to comprehend the positive correlation between the underlying market of fund managers, funds AUM, and investors seeking allocations in private markets on the one hand, and the secondary market size that is a derivative of those transaction sources, right, on the other hand. Now, there are some factors that can amplify that correlation, and they are particularly relevant nowadays. Uh, I may mention uh, a few of those, like uh, the denominator effect that still uh, holds up with public valuation corrections, exceeding valuation adjustments we have seen in private markets and uh, requiring institutional investors to adjust their portfolios accordingly. Uh, or liquidity pressures, uh, if you refer to LPs and specifically credit investors, uh, those pressures may be caused by uh, margining on interest rate or currency hatching overlays. Or, or if looking through GP's lenses, GP led transactions can provide liquidity to existing LPs and improve those relationships while also being able to expand the LP roster of GPs and to manage new pools of capital. So more generally, increasing demand for liquidity from investors is obviously positively impacting the growth of secondary markets. And likewise, other portfolio management considerations uh, can support the growth of secondaries, like the desire for cleaning up portfolios, right, that we uh, know all about, or changes in decision-making staff of institutional investors, and or a reshaping of the strategy, uh, also on the back of the current macroeconomic climate. Thinking of the repricing of risk premia, this may be a trigger for secondary activity to build portfolios along those lines. So one example could be to create more of a barbell approach nowadays uh, to focus more on senior credit on the one hand and uh, on special situations on the other hand uh, or on the other side of the risk spectrum. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Now that I covered some of the sources of secondary transactions, I would also like to quickly elaborate on the positive impact that secondaries can have in the private markets portfolio from a buyer's perspective. Uh, I mean, the buzzwords in this regard that I won't explain further for this purpose are J-curve mitigation, short duration, and diversification. Um, and additionally, to some extent, secondaries will also give investors the opportunity to benefit from counter-cyclical investment behavior, uh, which is particularly interesting in periods of market dislocation and price adjustments. So having said that, this part of the equation really requires a thorough understanding uh, of the valuation methodology and risks embedded in the underlying assets or low portfolios that uh, you would be acquiring. And this is where we really get into the heart of the secondary investing, the sensitivity checks across many different risk parameters you need to think of when acquiring an asset or an LP interest on the secondary market. And those risks can, can be related to uh, operating metrics of the underlying assets, revenue, costs, EBITDA sensitivities, market trends, GP quality and alignment, valuations, business models, uh, macroeconomic head or tailwinds in terms of interest rate, inflation, ethic sensitivities, recession resilience, uh, or specifically with regard to credit, loan structures, covenants, spreads, default rates, etc. So important here is really the identification of risk factors and then the weighting of them. In the end, as in every portfolio, you'll need to diversify away the idiosyncratic risks but you can just do that efficiently if you're able to identify them first, right? As a manager of secondary portfolios, you will not always be correct about the weighting of the risks uh, that you have identified. But as I said, you should really be able to identify those risks and structure your portfolio around it. 
Mm -hmm. Nowadays, I guess, with, with the avenue also of GPLAT transactions on top of the LPLAT deals that I have mostly referred to so far, diversification aspects of secondary portfolio even becomes more compelling. Uh, this is because you can really focus on particularly strong assets or loan portfolios and skew your portfolio uh, towards those high conviction deals, uh, which makes the portfolio even more attractive and looking at it from a, from a risk return perspective. So in the end, I think secondaries or credit secondaries for this purpose just provide another very valuable tool uh, in the uh, toolbox of portfolio construction in private markets. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like that. So in keeping with David's analogy of the Swiss Army knife, definitely another tool in the toolbox from a portfolio construction diversification perspective. Um, so let's take a question from the audience now. Um, a reminder for our audience to please post your questions to the chat. We will try our best to get through them. Um, but if we don't, we will reply after the event today. So there's one here on the current market environment, David, and I know you did touch on it earlier when you spoke about how in a rising interest rate environment, um, allocating to private debt can be used also as a tool to combat inflation. So um, I know you invest with managers on a daily basis and um, given the current macroeconomic environment of high interest rates and slower growth, many are saying that the private debt market is now going to be put to the test. If my memory serves me correctly, I think last week there was an article in the FT um, where um, it was stated there that Howard Marks from Oak Tree warns of crunch time for private credit. Um, what are your thoughts on this, David? And maybe you can touch on some of the key characteristics of the top quality managers out there who are expected to weather the storm. Sure. Well, you know, and it's a great article. I read it and um, as did many people uh, globally. And I think if you uh, unpacked it, uh, the headline uh, versus what actually Howard uh, said in the um, in the body, I mean, he was really making the case for private credit as being a source of liquidity. Um, and just to pick up on Benny's point uh, on private debt secondaries, Obviously, liquidity is one reason why an investor might go to the the, uh, the secondary market for uh, private credit or private equity or any other asset class for that matter. But liquidity is a is a central issue right now in the marketplace. And I think one of the things that Howard was trying to point out in that article was that very that very point, which is the private debt market has capital available to invest and provide liquidity to those situations to the borrowers whether those commercial borrowers whether that's a, a consumer or frankly into um you know very structured transactions the private debt market is is uh available for for that capital so i think you, you really need to unpack the headline from what he actually said uh he was really making the bull case for private debt I think lesson learned, don't just read the headlines, read the full article and unpack it and connect to David on LinkedIn to get the full lowdown. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, thanks for that. So let's let's go back to secondaries in particular and delve a bit deeper into that, Benny, because from what you spoke about GP-led, secondary-led, different transactions, it can all seem quite complicated for an investor. So, um, Benny, you are part of a dedicated secondary team that looks for opportunities, secondary opportunities across private market asset classes. Can you shed some light on some of the complexities and opportunities associated with maybe finding, analyzing and building a portfolio then of secondary opportunities? Yeah, sure. I mean, to be successful in secondaries, you really need to have sufficient breadth in your platform, right, to cover as many as possible. Uh, and certainly the strongest GPs in each and, and every sub-segment of, uh, of private markets investing. Uh, and don't forget, I mean, given the evolution of the asset classes and the involved parties, there is ever more crossover between strategies too. Uh, we see deals today that sit between private equity and infrastructure or between real estate and infrastructure or between impact and private equity, between credit, credit and equity. Uh, just uh, think of all the structured and, and preferred deals in this environment, for example. Or you have an asset uh, in your equity portfolio in which a sponsored loan GP, for example, uh, now invests in or, or, or vice versa, right? Um, so covering all those strategies within one platform enables you to fully leverage on those synergies. And this relates to soft information uh, on the one hand, but also pure data knowledge, uh, right? And the, the plethora of information available to our dedicated secondaries team is really crucial to be successful here. 
prioritize efficiently uh, and then really do the deep dive on the specific opportunities that we source out of our network of GPs, brokers and LPs, uh, followed by negotiations and then obviously also hand into off legal process uh, right through the execution of, uh, of such a deal. And during that review, it is really about the understanding of those uh, risk factors I went through before uh, and about how you diversify them across your portfolio to get out the most of this sub, sub segment of, of secondary investing. So our dedicated secondary team that covers actually secondary across all the asset classes uh, really acts within the transaction team, uh, which is uh, particularly relevant when thinking of the trend of GP led deals I alluded to before. Um, and we have seen uh, evolve uh, those deals over the past five years, in which corporate finance analysis and obviously also uh, very much resembles the co-investment work our colleagues are performing on behalf of our co-investment solutions. So the dedicated secretary team is also integrated in the transaction team, but also has very tight links to the broader platform um, and that has enabled us to be very, very active participant in the, in the GP-led market, uh, particularly over the past 30 months or so, in which we have deployed more than a billion dollars across more than 60 GP-led deals. So really very active there. And this is, uh, besides a substantial amount of LP-led opportunities we have closed during that period. And that is only possible really uh, in within that uh, broad platform uh, we are acting in. Mm -hmm. David, do you have any comments to add to drill down a bit more into private debt secondaries in particular? Yeah, one of the one of the things, and, and Benny and I have talked about it at, at length, is when you have asset owners who are looking for liquidity in a private debt portfolio, one of the things that we're seeing emerge right now is really the application of CLO technology, if you will, to a portfolio of private debt funds. Uh, what do I mean by that? Well, you know, effectively what uh, we see a number of LPs uh, doing who, you know, for a variety of reasons might need liquidity in their portfolio. They like the managers, they like the strategies, and they really don't want to sell the entire portfolio, uh, but they need some sort of liquidity, uh, which is a really a big theme that's in the marketplace right now, liquidity. So one of the things they're doing is they're going to asset uh, management firms and basically saying, why don't you take 75% of our private uh, uh, debt portfolio? And that could be either one manager, it could be it's typically a, a number of different managers, could be e even be uh, direct investments, co-investments and so forth. Why don't we take say 75% of that and, and put that into a vehicle um, which you buy and we will retain 25% of, um, of, of the remainder and still have a relationship with the GP and with the fund. So that very structured solution, which by the way, can be, be highly tailored to, any, to a situation um, uh, for any LP, we're seeing more and more of that technology sort of creep into the, the private debt market. And, and the reason is it's an asset class that generates yield. Uh, it has a low volatility uh, historically we've seen those numbers um and i would, I would refer folks to our um, our private debt white paper that we issued last year where we talked about volatility uh and the private debt market is is obviously very muted it's fundamentally value uh, valued asset class as opposed to one that's just based on on uh on on folks trading uh behind bluebird screens so we're seeing the structured solution become a more and more important part of the market where the LP, the asset owner says, we want to keep the portfolio. We just can't keep all of it. And um, there are new and emerging strategies in the private debt market to take advantage of that and help those asset owners with those liquidity needs. Mm -hmm. And are those particular solutions run by asset managers as well? Absolutely. Uh, yeah. And that's something I know Benny and I are, you know, we're, we're starting to explore as well uh -huh. um, and working with our asset management partners globally. Mm -hmm. um, so, Benny, you spoke about it a bit and, um, you know, LP led transactions, GP led tra transactions and activity in 2022 in particular was dominated by LP portfolio sales. Um, do you expect to see a pickup in GP led secondaries given the current environment? Um, maybe you can unpack this a bit more. Sure. Uh, so it, it's true, actually, yeah, that LP uh, lets outpace GP lets again in uh, 2022 uh, by some percentage points. Uh, and it may be the same in 23 uh, again, just given the uncertainty uh, around valuations that normally nourishes the LP let transaction volume, right? 
however, if you look actually at the longer term trajectory, uh, say over five years or so, then uh, you see GPLATs growing at slightly uh, more than 20%, I think the number is, uh, and LPLATs a bit below 10% per annum. Uh, so it, it's certainly good to see that uh, we have growth in both segments, uh, providing for, for an ever larger opportunity set, uh, which uh, just makes this market very attractive. And you can really build your portfolio uh, along your strongest convictions, which is just what uh, David mentioned before as well, right? Um, so uh, I guess uh, GP lets will, will not uh, reduce in terms of volume and uh, will mm -hmm. remain very relevant as well as uh, LP lets secondaries as well. And, and on that point, too, I mean, just to unpack that a little bit more, if you look at portfolio NAV finance, uh, that is a growing area in the private debt area. Uh, and that is where a asset management firm, a private debt lender will go to a GP and will provide a loan against a number of different things. It could be a loan against management fees. It could be a loan against carried interest. Or, frankly, uh, it could be a loan against a portfolio of assets that are later in their life that the GP, maybe they're out of the investment period and they, they want to or would like to uh, have an add-on acquisition and trying to find co-investment capital or uh, other types of capital to support that specific portfolio company might be difficult to do um, in, 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 um, in a silo. So what they do is effectively use their entire portfolio as collateral for a loan um, as part of this portfolio NAV finance. So, you know, it's interesting. We're seeing more and more interesting technology um, go into, I would say, the private markets broadly. This is not just a uh, limited to, to private debt. This, this solution I just spoke about really cuts across private equity, private debt, real estate, and, um, and, and infrastructure, obviously all the private market asset classes. So again, back to my some of the comments I made uh, earlier in, in our, um, uh, our, our, uh, our session here, the market is continuing to grow and it's also continuing to specialize. And we think that's very healthy for the market. Mm -hmm. um, well, we are coming up to time almost. And before we end, I do want to spend some time um, just having a bit of a, a summary or some final thoughts from each of you on key takeaways for our audience. Um, so Benny, maybe you can give your top two or three takeaways for the audience um, and then we'll move on to David. Yeah, thank you, Sivot. Uh, you know, it was a pleasure actually doing this today with you. Uh, well, David, you can, so you can reward yourself with some chocolate after this, I think. <laughs> I know. My favorite chocolate can <laughs> so, Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'll send the cross. <laughs> so, no, just as a final thought, I mean, I may say, you know, credit secondaries, um, specifically, they are still relatively young, right? Uh, so it is a sub market but it is growing very quickly. Uh, and uh, effectively, um, if we look at the last year's figures, uh, credit secondaries were actually the, uh, the strongest had or have seen the strongest growth uh, across all the, the secondary markets, uh, but also, uh, I mean, obviously coming from, from moderate levels. Uh, so it is still small, uh, but there is no doubt, just looking at the overall size of the of the debt market and of the opportunities that David also alluded to during that uh, during that session, uh, that the secondaries will become ever more meaningful and play an as important role in credit portfolio construction as this is already the case in our private equity, uh, real estate uh, infrastructure and impact portfolios. David, any thoughts from you? Yeah, I would agree with Benny. I mean, if you, if you think about private equity 20 or 25 years ago and the growth in private equity asset class, we, we saw a growth in private equity secondaries. So it just follows natural logic as we've seen a growth in, in private debt um, as an asset class that was you know, several hundred million dollars a decade ago. And, you know, today um, there are a number of numbers being thrown around, but it's somewhere between a 1.3 and a 1.5 trillion dollar asset class. So it's seen a tremendous amount of growth. Uh, so you would normally expect the secondary market to also follow the growth of, of that asset class. So uh, we're looking forward to um, you know being a, a player in that market um, as it uh, as it continues to develop. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I, one last thing, I want to just a shout out to the global private debt team, um, just the finest group of people I've, uh, I've worked with, and uh, they work very hard every day. 
looking at all aspects of the private debt market. And uh, I just did a recently uh, a podcast with uh, with uh, Joe Abrams and Tamsin Coleman, uh, who are in our London office on private debt. And I encourage everyone to listen to uh, to that on, on LinkedIn. Now, that sounds good. I, I definitely look forward to that. And I know I mentioned to our audience to connect with you on LinkedIn, but I believe you both will be doing some traveling as well coming up soon. There's some events happening. Um, David, I think you'll be in Atlanta, if I'm not mistaken, it's first week of June. Yes, I'll be at our Atlanta Global Investment Forum, and I'd invite every uh, asset manager to call, sign up. Um, we have links for for that. Uh, I'll be there from uh, June 5th through uh, June 7th, and I look forward to uh, to seeing everybody there. So sign up. And Benny, you also be traveling, right? So to Berlin, yes, exactly. Yeah, Stay yeah, in Europe okay. uh, at Super Return, where uh, the zoo, uh, how many market participants call it, uh, where we'll see a lot of private equity managers, but also private debt uh, managers are more and more present there. So uh, looking forward to it. Uh, so it's the same week. I think it's uh, 5th of June until the 8th or so. Yeah. Okay, right. well, that sounds pretty exciting. Hopefully next year I can join you both at one of those. Um, but it's been great chatting to you. And I've tried to put together a bit of a summary on key takeaways for me from today's conversation. I'm sure there's many, many more. But given that I'm the host, my capacity to jot down stuff is quite limited. Uh, but that being said, I, I've, I've really enjoyed the conversation. And there's a couple of key points and takeaways that I, I want to mention. So from the conversation we've had, it's clear that the private debt market continues to grow and we are seeing an increase in levels of specialization. David mentioned NAV lending, GP solutions, the use of technology to come up with interesting solutions as well is definitely an area to look at. Um, given the increasing demand for liquidity, we are seeing an increase in secondary market activity, which there again can be a useful tool for our investors in building their portfolios, successful portfolios. To solve for building a successful secondary portfolio, it is helpful uh, to have depth and breadth in your team to source, analyze, and build a portfolio. And Benny Bauman confirmed that in terms of the complexity and time he spends in building those portfolios. And uh, yeah, as, as a headline, in terms of market activity, 2022 definitely saw the strongest growth in secondary market activity when it came to credit secondaries in particular on the private debt side. So those were some of the key takeaways for me that I managed to jot down. Um, I want to thank you both again for joining me in this conversation. And I want to thank our audience for participating as well. Please do take care and follow Mercer Investments on LinkedIn. Thanks, Zina. You've been great. Thank you very much, David. Cheers.